It is indeed an honor and a pleasure to find myself addressing the Department of English at the University of Toronto, and perhaps especially so since I do so on Halloween, one of Scotland's gifts to the world that persists and grows despite lack of recognition by that most diligent observer of holidays, the postal authorities, a day highly appropriate for the, the, the delivery of the Gros Potiron lecture. And it is fitting that I am able here in Canada where so many Scots have settled, in the very building that houses the university's Centre for Diaspora and Transnational Studies, to announce the publication of the first number of a new journal devoted to the study of the Scottish diaspora. We at the University of Berwick-upon-Tweed, situated as we are in the no-man's land that marks the interface between Scotland and the rest of the world, feel a particular responsibility in this regard, and we are confident that our new journal will appeal to many readers around the world under its distinctive and inspiring name, Diasporan. <laughs> but it is not to contribute to diaspora studies that I stand before you gathered here together this afternoon. McGonagall's diasporic aspect has yet to be treated adequately. Modesty forbids me to do more than mention my own four-volume study of the drift toward Orientalism, in McGonagall's shipwreck poems, but I would single out Edgar Runcible's McGonagall and Victorian Militarism from El Teb to Omdurman, and Dame Kirsty McStagger's William McGonagall and the Women's Suffrage Movement as outstanding recent books on McGonagall and the great public issues of his day and our own. Today, looking back to the late Archibald Finnan Haddie's seminal article of 1938, William McGonagall's Match Girl and the Social Credit Movement, I want to redirect attention to the other side of his genius, the McGonagall who suffered with the poor even as he celebrated the victorious, who rendered more than any other the spontaneous life beneath the levels of culture and self-consciousness. But first, as we gathered here together this afternoon to celebrate McGonagall's achievement, uh, let us pause for a moment. Every day, as I contemplate that mighty oeuvre, that coruscating corpus of choreography, and the ever-increasing flood of critical studies that pours from the university presses of the English-speaking world, I feel moved to cry out with Victor Frankenstein, It's alive! It's alive! William McGonagall, poet and tragedian. These words greet us on the title page of each of the three volumes that make up the works of the master, the confident note of poetic gems, the optimistic turn sounded by more poetic gems, and then the plangent finality of last poetic gem. <laughs> Likewise, the portrait which stands as frontispiece to the whole is signed Poet and Tragedian. My concern this afternoon is chiefly with the poet, but a word must be said about the tragedian. But before I embark on that, I must pause for a moment on a little word, and. Poet and tragedian. Now, and is, of course, a conjunction, which in its original Latin sense of conjunction means that which joins together. A joining together of course implies the existence of two distinct and separate entities. And so here McGonagall, with his accustomed economy of word and phrase, conveys this dichotomy and his awareness of this dichotomy that underlies all of his life and work. And when I say William McGonagall, tragedian, do I mean that McGonagall explores with Aeschylus the Promethean heights of human experience? That he plumbs with Sophocles the depth of human misery, that like Shakespeare he creates a leer upon the heath, or coming closer to his own time, that with Henrik Ibsen he probes the anthractuosities of human deficiencies in the face of societal pressures, substituting for the icy fjords of Norway the more homely foreshore of Dundee. Are these, I ask, the kinds of things we mean when we speak of William McGonagall tragedian? No. What we mean is that he was an actor, a thespian, and he tells us thus of his debut. My first appearance on any stage was in Mr. Giles's theatre, 
which was in Lindsay Street Quarry. I cannot give the exact date, but it is a very long time ago. The character that I appeared in was Macbeth, Mrs. Giles sustaining the character of Lady Macbeth on that occasion, which she performed admirably. The way that I was allowed to perform was the following, that I had to give Mr. Giles one pound in cash before the performance. When I appeared on the stage, I was received with a perfect storm of applause, but when I exclaimed, Command, they make a halt upon the heath, the applause was deafening and was continued during the entire evening, especially so in the combat scene. The house was crowded during each of the three performances on that ever-memorable night. I received plaudit after plaudit of applause in recognition of my able impersonation of Macbeth. But despite this huge histrionic success, genius called McGonagall in another direction. The heavenly muse commanded him to sing. Not even Milton's invocation of the muse Urania and Paradise Lost can vie with the sharply etched detail and the immediacy of McGonagall's account of this turning point in his career. The most startling incident in my life was the time I discovered myself to be a poet, which was in the year 1877. During the Dundee holiday week, in the bright and balmy month of June, when trees and flowers were ill in full bloom, while lonely and sad in my room, thinking about the thousands of people who were away by rail and steamboat, perhaps to the land of Burns or elsewhere, wherever their minds led them. Well, while pondering so, I seemed to feel, as it were, a strange kind of feeling stealing over me, and remained so for about five minutes. A flame seemed to kindle up my entire frame, along with a strong desire to write poetry, and I felt so happy, so happy, that I was inclined to dance. And then I began to pace backwards and forwards in the room, but the more I tried to shake off all thought of writing poetry, the stronger the sensation became. It was so strong that I imagined a pen was in my right hand and a voice crying, write, write. So I said to myself, ruminating, let me see, what shall I write? Then all at once a bright idea struck me to write about my best friend, the late Reverend George Gilfillan. Therefore, I immediately found paper, pen, and ink, and set myself down to immortalize the great preacher, poet, and orator. These are the lines I penned. Reverend George Gilfillan of Dundee, there is none can you excel. You have boldly rejected the confession of faith and defended your cause right well. The first time I heard him speak, it was in the Kinnaird Hall, lecturing on the Garibaldi movement as loud as he could bawl. My blessings on his noble form and on his lofty head. May all good angels guard him while living and hereafter when he's dead. Before attempting to unpack the manifold imbrications of this densely compacted lyric, I want to draw attention to one detail that has been too often overlooked. The climactic line at the center of the poem, as loud as he could bawl, is taken in its entirety from William Cooper's well-known ballad, The Diverting History of John Gilpin. The dogs did bark, the children screamed up, flew the windows all, and every soul cried out, well done, as loud as he could bawl. What a master stroke of intertextuality this is. <laughs> it condenses the crowd of Cooper's original into the single person of Gilfillan, while bringing all the Bactinian carnivalesque energy of the comic ballad to reinforce the elegiac moment, bringing out the pathos of Gilfillan as Garibaldian eulogist. Indeed, as we move from such points of detail to the larger sweep of the poem, we find the same paradoxical, some would say oxymoronic, interplay of opposites. Celebration of Gilfillan's living activities ends in a foreshadowing of his death, and the two can only be held together by the transcendental power of poetry itself. I set myself down, McGonagall tells us, to immortalize the late Reverend George Gilfillan. 
And McGonagall shares, in full measure, the Victorian fascination with death and hoped for transcendence that characterizes Victorian trauma. Let us consider first that little match girl I mentioned earlier, marginalized and exploited by an uncaring society. This is incidentally a brilliant example of McGonagall's capacity to improve upon his source, in this case a tale by Hans Christian Andersen. It was biting cold and the falling snow which filled a poor little match girl's heart with woe, who was bareheaded and barefooted as she went along the street, crying, who'll buy my matches, for I want pennies to buy some meat. When she left home, she had slippers on, but alas, poor child, now they were gone, for she lost both of them while hurrying across the street out of the way of two carriages which were near by her feet. So the little girl went on while the snow fell thick and fast and the child's heart felt cold and downcast for nobody had bought any matches that day which filled her little mind with grief and dismay. Reduced to desperation, afraid to return home without selling any matches, the match girl lights one of her stock to keep herself warm but in vain. And she lighted the match, and it burned brightly, and it helped to fill her heart with glee. And she thought she was sitting at a stove very grand, but alas, she was found dead with a match in her hand. Her body was found half covered with snow, and as the people gazed thereon, their hearts were full of woe, and many present let fall a burning tear, because she was found dead on the last night of the year. Here is none of Anderson's consolatory vision of entering into glory with a deceased grandmother. Rather, with perfect Jamesian pathos and symmetry, one thinks both of the wings of the dove and of the hourglass structure of the ambassadors. The woe which in the opening stanzas fills the heart of the match girl is transferred to the hearts of the people who find her cryogenized remains. Hearts earlier frozen against her pleas that they should purchase her matches. Transfigured in her last moments by the entirely this-worldly idea of a visionary stove, her heart fills with glee, that central McGonagallican concept. The tear let drop by the formerly heartless people is a burning tear. The almost metaphysical tension between their cold hearts and hot tears of remorse is driven home by the fin de siècle note of the final line, because she was found dead on the last night of the year. McGonagall's deep sense of the self-inflicted wounds of a society divided by class, a society in which, as we learn elsewhere in the poem, abusive fathers wait at home to beat daughters unable to meet their sales quotas, is not limited to those living in urban slums. For a sense of his equal sensitivity to social trauma at a higher level, his appreciation of C.P. Snow's famous insight, we die alone, consider these lines on the death of the Queen Empress Victoria. Alas, our noble and generous Queen Victoria is dead, and I hope her soul to heaven has fled, to sing and rejoice with saints above, where all is joy, peace, and love. It was on January 22nd, 1901, in the evening she died at 6.30 o'clock, which to the civilized world was a great shock. She was surrounded by her children and grandchildren dear, and for the motherly pious queen they shed many a tear. And during her reign in this world of trouble and strife, several attempts were made to take her life. Maclean, he tried to shoot her, but he did fail but he was erected, arrested and sent to an asylum which made him bewail. Amid the word worldwide outpouring of grief for the deceased sovereign, the wail of the madman is heard. The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate, the queen at Balmoral amid the bonny Heine, highland floral, Maclean in his asylum. And McGonagall, like Shakespeare, surveys all mankind with equal interest and respect, surveys mankind indeed from China to Peru with most extensive view, with equal clarity, and one might say with equal charity. Here is what Dr. Levis called the abundance of felt life, an abundance sustained by McGonagall's sense 
of the centrality of the great literary tradition to which he so eminently belongs. That tradition, equally supportive of the heroic, no less than of the quotidian. First, from the miniature epic, the Apillion, on the relief of Mafeking. Long life and prosperity to Colonel Baden Powell, for there's very few generals can him excel. For during his defense of Mafeking from grief, he kept the people's hearts from breaking, because he sang to them and did recite passages from Shakespeare, which did their hearts delight. And then from his memorial idol on the death of the official laureate, Lord Tennyson. He believed in the Bible, also in Shakespeare, which he advised young men to read without any fear. And by following the advice of both works therein, they would never or seldom commit any sin. <laughs> but I digress. It was but a little more than a year after his appearance as Macbeth that McGonagall made his visit to journey to visit Queen Victoria at Balmoral Castle. Flushed with the success of such early masterpieces as The Battle of the Nile, The Beautiful Village of Pennycook, and A New Year's Resolution to Leave Dundee, the poet sent a copy of his poems to his sovereign, receiving a letter of acknowledgement in return. Armed with this letter, McGonagall set out for the Queen's summer residence in Scotland at Balmoral Castle. It was on a bright summer morning in the month of July 1878, I left Dundee en route for Balmoral, the highland home of Her Most Gracious Majesty, Queen of Great Britain and Empress of India. Well, my first stage for the day was the village of Aylith. Then I wended my way the next day to the spittle of Glenshee, which is the most dismal to see, with its bleak rocky mountains and clear crystal fountains with their misty foam, and thousands of sheep there together do roam, browsing on the barren pasture, blasted like to see. And, my dear friends, when I arrived at the spittle of Glenshee, a dreadful thunderstorm came on, and vivid flashes of forked lightning were fearful to behold, and the rain poured down in torrents until I was drenched to the skin and longed to be under cover from the pitiless rain. I arrived at a shepherd's house near by the wayside and knocked at the door fearlessly. The shepherd himself came to the door, and I told him I wanted a lodging for the night. And at first he seemed unwilling, perhaps taking me for a burglar or a sheep stealer. But when I showed him Her Most Gracious Majesty's royal letter that I had received from her for my poetical abilities, he immediately took me by the hand and bade me come in. The next morning I soon came in sight of the Castleton of Braemar, and I arrived at the lodge gates of the Palace of Balmoral just as the tower clock chimed three. I walked boldly forward and knocked loudly at the porter's lodge door, and was immediately answered by the two constables that are there night and day, and one of them asked me, in a very authoritative voice, what I wanted, and of course I told him I wanted to see Her Majesty. He asked me if I had brought any of my poetry with me, and I showed him the second edition, and he looked at the front of it and said, You are not poet to Her Majesty, Tennyson's the real poet to Her Majesty. Then he said, well, what do you charge for this book of poems? And I said, tuppence. And he gave it me, telling me to go straight home and not to think of coming back again to Balmoral. So I bade him goodbye and retraced my steps, arriving in Dundee on Saturday early in the day, footsore and weary, but not in the least discouraged. One hardly knows what to wonder at more. The exhausting journey leading only to humiliating rejection or the poet's buoyancy in the face of these traumatic events. But McGonagall was the least self-absorbed of poets. His own drenching he passes over in as little time as it takes to record the mere fact. Compare his treatment of meteorological trauma, once again incurred by a demonstration of loyalty to Queen Victoria, in his account of an event on August 25th, 1881. The Royal Review. All hail to the Empress of India, Great Britain's Queen. Long may she live in health, happy and serene. That came from London far away 
to review the Scottish volunteers in grand array, most magnificent to be seen near by Salisbury crags and its pastures green, which will long be remembered by our gracious Queen, and by the volunteers that came from far away, because it rained most of the day. And with the rain their clothes were all wet through on the 25th day of August at the Royal Review. And to the volunteers it was no lark, because they were ankle deep in mud in the Queen's Park, which proved to the Queen that they were loyal and true to endure such hardships at the Royal Review. Oh, it was a most beautiful scene to see the Forfarshire artillery marching past the Queen. Her Majesty, with their steady marching, felt content, especially when their arms to her they did present. That reference to the Forfarshire artillery reminds us of another tale of trauma, Grace Darling, or the wreck of the Forfarshire. A shipwreck was, of course, one of McGonagall's great subjects. No poet in the language, I venture the claim, no poet in any language has produced more shipwreck poems than McGonagall. From the early, almost Virgilian pastoral elegy, the wreck of the steamer London while on her way to Australia, to the richly impastoed Georgic of the wreck of the bark Linton when bound for Aspinall, having on board 1,000 tons of coal, to the late condensed epic masterpiece, McGonagall's Paradise Regained, as Tilliard called it, an excursion steamer sunk in the River Tay. He has left an unparalleled corpus, almost, almost a corpus delicti, of poems on this quintessentially Victorian traumatic theme. As everyone remembers, the good ship Forfarshire was wrecked off the Farne Islands in 1838, soon after Victoria's accession to the throne. McGonagall, with his accustomed economy of word and phrase, captures the struggle of ship and crew in increasingly adverse weather. There she laboured in the heavy sea against both wind and tide, while a dense fog enveloped her on every side and the mighty billows made her timbers creak, until at last, unfortunately, she sprung a leak. <laughs> All efforts are vain, and the ship breaks on a rock. But the wreck is noticed by the daughter of the lighthouse keeper, Grace Darling. By the first streak of dawn she early up had been, and happened to look out upon the stormy scene. And she descried the wreck through the morning gloom, but she resolved to rescue them from such a perilous doom. Then she cried, Oh, Father dear, come here and see the wreck. See, here, take the telescope and you can inspect. Oh, Father, try and save them and heaven you will bless. But, my darling, no help can reach them in such a storm as this. Oh, my kind Father, you will surely try and save these poor souls from a cold and watery grave. Oh, I cannot sit to see them perish before mine eyes, and for the love of heaven do not my pleading despise. Then old darling yielded and launched the little boat, and high on the big waves the boat did float. Then Grace and her father took each an oar in hand, and to see Grace darling rowing, the picture was grand. And as the little boat to the sufferers drew near, Poor souls, they tried to raise a cheer, but as they gazed upon the heroic Grace, the big tears trickled down each sufferer's face. Grace Darling was a comely lass, with long fair floating hair, with soft blue eyes and shy and modesty rare, and her countenance was full of sense and genuine kindliness, with a noble heart and ready to help suffering creatures in distress. And nine persons were rescued almost dead with the cold, by modest and lovely Grace Darling, that heroine bold. How brilliantly is the drama and the trauma of this rescue conveyed. Notice the intensification achieved by the sly <coughs> self-referentiality of the father's addressing his daughter, whose surname, like his own, is Darling, as my darling. Like the burning tears of the remorseful passers-by and the little match girl, this turn achieves an extraordinary imbrication of word and trope. And even at the crucial moment of rescue, 
when the sailors still remaining in the wrecked ship see their rescuers finally alongside, the trauma of male and patriarchal attitudinizing is marvelously written into the text, but as they gazed upon the heroic grace. Here is the objectifying male gaze, reducing the female whose power as a rower is about to save their lives to the level of a mere comely lass with long floating hair, with soft blue eyes, a candidate for playbait bunny of the year. <laughs> McGonagall's even-handed re recognition, both of the sufferings of the sailors and of their callous objectification of their selfless rescuer, reveals clearly his mastery of that clarity of vision that Keats called negative capability. But trauma is not merely individual and personal. Trauma may be experienced by groups, communities, even nations. Typical here is the opening of descriptive juttings of London. As I stood <coughs> upon London Bridge and viewed the mighty throng of thousands of people in cabs and buses rapidly whirling along, all furiously driving to and fro, up one street and down another as quick as they could go. Then I was struck with the discordant sounds of human voices there, which seemed to me like wild geese cackling in the air. And the Tower of London is most gloomy to behold, and the crown of England lies there be gemmed with precious stones and gold. King Henry VI was murdered there by the Duke of Gloucester, and when he killed him with his sword, he called him an imposter. <laughs> I did not know death had undone so many. It is amazing that no previous commentator on the wasteland has recognized this passage as the source of the famous lines at the close of the first section of that poem. From the crowds crossing London Bridge, we pass by way of a simile based on a natural world thrown into disorder, wild geese cackling, to the tower and its treasure. But the crown promptly recalls a murder done to possess it, one which brings back the theme dear to McGonagall as to Eliot of wrongful assumption of identity. He called him an imposter. <clears throat> McGonagall's funeral poems develop this shared sense of loss, of rupture, of the emergence into the enunciative presence of transg transgression as it conflicts with the impulse to transcendence. Consider the death of Lord and Lady Dalhousie. Alas, Lord and Lady Dalhousie are dead and buried at last, which causes many people to feel a little downcast. 